Welcome to the Economics of Soil Health, a video presented by American Farmland Trust and Cargill Regen Connect as part of our Soil Health video series. If you haven't checked out the other videos in this series, be sure to look through the options on the playlist. In this video, Soil Health farmers, Greg, Eric, Rorick, and Daryl, share how implementing soil health practices have impacted their bottom line. We are also joined by three American Farmland Trust staff whose work focuses on the intersection of agricultural, economics, and soil health. Michelle Perez, Water Initiative Director, an agricultural economist, Ellen Yateman, and Ben Wiersinski provide insight to their research on the economic benefits of soil health. I hope you enjoy. So I don't think we can start talking about what agricultural economics is before we start talking about more generally what economics is. So economics is the study of how people react under scarcity, how they make decisions based off of incentives. So it's all about decision making. And so agricultural economics is just economics within the context of agriculture. So it's not just a farmer's bottom line. It's not just their net income or their returns. It's everything that goes into all the decisions that they make on their farm. So when we think about this in the context of adopting conservation practices, yeah, it's, it's how that practice will affect their bottom line, but it's, it's also how it will affect you know, their work-life balance, their long-term future, their short-term risk. It's what, is it a practice they believe in? Is it a cultural practice? Is it something that they're connected to? So there's a whole bunch of different factors. And then what that means for an individual farmer, though, is that they're kind of analyzing all of these things when they make their decision whether to adopt. The two biggest points that I always make when trying to explain what agricultural economics is, is number one, uh, economics is not finance. And number two, economics is the, the study of decision making. I think that's the best, shortest way to describe it. A financial analysis analyzes simply cash flow in and out, while economic analysis analyzes what variables are considered in decisions to understand why people make certain decisions, or why those preferences exist, and explain uh, outcomes as private and public costs and benefits. We here at American Farmland Trust are trying to answer this question, how does adoption of soil health practice affect a farm's return on investment? It's to interview already soil health successful farmers to gather their experience, direct experience changes in costs and benefits since adopting soil health practices. AFT's Soil Health Case Study Project developed four methods to evaluate the economic water quality and climate outcomes experienced by soil health successful farmers and communicated those results in compelling two-page case studies. The completed list of published case studies from across the country can be found on our Farmland Information Center by going to farmlandinfo.org and searching soil health case studies or by following the link in the video description. Our AFT team is going to take a few minutes now to summarize their findings and highlight one of the case studies from Ohio. We found that there are three main financial categories that are often affected in a positive way when farmers adopt soil health practices. The first is machinery, labor, and fuel costs. So as one can easily imagine, when you're going from multiple conventional tillage passes to no-till or strip-till, you are really cutting down on the wear and tear of your tractors, you're saving diesel fuel, and you're creating a lot more time that you could commit to family, uh, friends, hobbies, or invest back into the farm. The second area that we've seen affected positively is reductions in fertilizers and chemicals. Oftentimes, farmers get to experience the ability to cut back. Sometimes they increase as well, but um, we have a lot of indications that farmers can reduce their fertilizer applications and their herbicide or pesticide costs. 
because of soil health practice adoption. And the third area is that sometimes yields do increase. And if they don't increase, often farmers report feeling that their yields are more resilient to erratic weather conditions. Um, so they don't experience as um, many losses as they have in the past, which they attribute to the healthier soil that they're seeing achieved because of their investment. We found that across those 10, eight out of 10 of them reported an increase in yield that they attribute to their soil health practices. And most of all of them have adopted all three main categories of soil health practices, reduced tillage, cover crops, and nutrient management. Two of those 10 farms reported no change in yield. Overall, all 10 farmers reported an increase in annual income which ranged from $4 to $56 per acre, and a return on investment that was positive, ranging from 7 to 343%. In terms of fertilizer costs, five out of 10 farmers were able to reduce them, three saw no change in their fertilizer costs, and two farms increased their costs. When it comes to machinery, fuel, and labor costs due to change in tillage, nine out of 10 of them reduced their costs and one farmer reported no change. When it comes to pesticide usage, and that covers herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, five farmers reported no change, five farmers did report a change, and that was split between three farms that increased those costs and two farms that were able to achieve savings. In terms of learning costs, we thought that was important to estimate because Changing your operations means you have to invest in yourself and your learning. And that ranged from 17 to 160 hours per year, or about 415 to $3,000 per year per farmer. And finally, when it came to environmental benefits, all 10 farmers said they could see improvements in the soil. They could see improvements in less soil and water runoff from their fields. And when we estimated their water quality benefits using USDA's nutrient tracking tool, all of them had nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment reductions, which ranged from 50 to 75% on average. When we estimated their climate benefits using USDA's Comet Farm tool, we found that on average, greenhouse gas reductions occurred by 188%. Well, I'd love to tell you a little bit more about what we found for Eric Nehemiah of Mad Max Farms and our soil health economic and environmental case study for him. He farms about 1,200 acres in Marion and Delaware counties in Ohio. And in 2011, he went 100% no-till corn and soybeans. In 2014, 100% uh, cover crops um, behind both of those crops. And in 2011, he also adopted variable rate nutrient management. And his reasons for adopting was he wanted to eliminate runoff and erosion. He wanted better nutrient cycling. He wanted to improve weed management. And his goal was to make dead soil alive again. And what we found after interviewing him and estimating the costs and benefits before and after soil health practice adoption, was that he had an improvement of $38 per acre on average, or an increase in total net income of $47,000, and a return on his investment in soil health of 35%. In particular, he highlights the benefits from planting green into growing cover crops and terminating with a roller crimper. He's been able to nearly eliminate residual herbicides and that saved him about $18 per acre. And he's cut in half his soybean seed treatment cost, saving another $6 per acre. And Eric attributes his yield bumps in corn. He went from 165 to 195 bushels per acre and his yield bumps in soybeans going from 45 to 65 bushels per acre to his soil health practices. So we're thrilled that Eric's been able to share his story and we're thrilled to be able to quantify it using our rigorous partial budget analysis approach. As far as what has it meant to, I'm going to say our ROI, because that encapsulates, you know, fuel usage, horsepower, owning tillage tools, maintaining tillage tools, diesel fuel time, of course, it's reduced all of that stuff, right? And, uh, you know, my yields are competitive with 
our neighboring farmers that are so conventionally farming. They're competitive with what they were when you know we were conventionally farming. Um, I would argue though that our ROI is better because we've cut a lot of those other costs out of the equation. And oh, by the way, at the same time, I truly believe we're increasing the value of our land because we're improving the health of the soil, which ultimately is gonna produce a, a better, more nutrient dense crop. I've seen reduced erosion and gullying and, and, and runoff from my farms. Um, we've seen and observed a sweeter smelling soil and just a more beautiful soil. Um, loads and loads of earthworms and, and you know, pollinators out there as well, um, you know, that are just, they're bringing, you know, that natural benefits. In addition to that, though, we've been able to reduce our, our uh, input cost on pesticides for sure. Um, as mentioned a minute ago, we're not using any residual herbicides. Our, our herbicide use is down because we're, we're able to use some of the cover crops to help and assist in, in weed suppression. Are my fields perfectly clean? No, but they're within a, a threshold, a management threshold that makes sense, right? And uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, we're, we're seeing improvement in, in our soil tests, uh, in the nutrient uh, um, density of the crop that we're producing, the quality of the crop we're producing, and, and ultimately higher ROI per acre. The adoption of full health practices can affect a farm's return on investment, also known as ROI, um, in many ways. And the classic agricultural economist answer will always be, it depends. You know, it depends on the lifespan of the soil health practices, the soil type where you're in crop, where you're in historic management practices, where you're adopting soil health practices. If a farmer's interested in soil, adopting soil health practices, the best way to try to estimate what the impact is going to be on your return on investment is look locally. You know, farmers that are adopting soil practices in your neck of the woods are going to know best how different soil practices are um, should be adopted. My advice for a farmer just starting out on their soil health journey as an economist would be first make sure you, you realize that this is a long-term investment. Um, you're going to have to work at this. You're going to have to keep going with it. You might not see results right away and don't let that get you dismayed. And along those same lines is one thing that through kind of talking to farmers that they've told us that have been successful with soil health practices is don't feel like you need to start with the entirety of your farm. Pick a field, give it, make that your experiment field, try out different cover crop mixes, Work on a smaller scale until you find out what's right for you. You don't need to, to change over your whole farm in one season. Another important factor is make sure you realize that this is going to take a lot of research, a lot of changing how you, you're used to doing things. And so it's not just the on the field cost. It's the cost of learning. It's the cost of just adjusting how you've always done something and being comfortable with doing something new. You're going to have to change how potentially the person before you farmed, and, and that's, that can take, take a little bit of time of adjusting to. So just prepare yourself for that. Talk to other farmers about how they've done it. Realize that it's, it's going to take a, a commitment to learning something new. I call it a system. And so that system uh, is ever evolving, ever changing, and uh, that is somewhat restricted by having a return on investment, but also the capital outlay. So we work very closely with a lot of industry partners uh, to be able to not only look at, evaluate those tools and processes inside of those cropping systems, uh, but also to, you know, what does that mean um, for an investment for someone to grow and, and adopt that into the next layer, that next generation of farming. But it's not all about farming as many acres as possible. It's more about farming acres the right way and getting the highest return off of an, on investment off of each one of those acres. My goal is not to have the highest yields in the county or the state. 
I mean, that's great if you're up there, but what really matters is how much money are you making, right? I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's what we're in, in this business for, is to make money and support our families and be able to continue to do this. You know, we have seen improvements. We've been able to reduce input costs, um, and we continue to, to move the, the, the meter on that. Well, I think it's actually working as a community then together. So for example, I, we've got some neighbors that we work with. Uh, we help them do a few things on their farm and they've helped us do a few things on ours. So for example, we need to help at, at harvest to take off soybeans. Well, they were done. So they came over, helped us harvest and then actually helped us apply cover crops. Um, what did we do? How did we work together with them? I've helped you know, make spray recommendations. We've traded equipment. So it's kind of a thing where, honestly, I think if you can partner up with another farmer or a group of farmers, I think you can, we can really do some really great things. So it comes back to, uh, if we wanna reduce the challenges out there, we gotta come back as a community to begin implementing these techniques. Finance is a huge one. You know, we rely so much on, on um, software that, that helps you profit and, and uh, income and, and uh, expense and then profit and loss statements and balance sheets. You have got to pay attention to finance. Just because you go out, your sweat equity is, is gone if you don't pay attention to your finances. And, and I'm self-taught. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand any of those things, but you know, you hired a young attorney, you hired a young CPA, you know, you hired a young agronomist and all, all the support people you could find to build around that. Our next step is kind of one generation beyond that, or maybe two, is, is what, how do, we, how do we take it to the next level? How do we level up? And, but we're still asking the same questions of what I just proposed to anybody that's trying to get started with it. It has to have an ROI. It has to fit into your current situation. Thank you for tuning in to our soil health video series. If this is the first video you've watched, be sure to check out the other videos in the playlist. For more information about Cargill Region Connect or American Farmland Trust, the team bringing you these videos, follow the links in the video description. As always, thank you to our technical expert and farmers for sharing their time and knowledge to continue promoting soil health in agriculture. I'll leave you now with closing words from Water Initiative Director, Michelle Peretz. So soil health practices are the guardrails that AFT is trying to prioritize because they keep the soil, the water, the fertilizer and the chemicals in place where they're working for that crop. At the bottom of the field are the vegetative edge of field practices like riparian buffers and tree buffers and also structural practices such as terraces or water and sediment control basins. They help too, but those are ambulances. When the problem has not yet been addressed in the field by the guardrails, those soil health practices. So we hope that farmers consider this analogy when thinking about their investment in soil health first.